Grace and peace in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Yahshua the Messiah, Emmanuel, God with us. Welcome back to the dinner table. I know the message caught you off guard, right? You're like, wow, the wine of God? What is this about? Well, what you think? I mean, look at all the beautiful grapes. That's going to be your dinner plate for today. You got a whole lot of grapes to dive into. We got a we got a powerful message that the Holy Ghost has been so gracious to give us. Um, why don't we start with a quick prayer? Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Yahshua the Messiah, forgive us for all of our sins. Wash us in your blood. Renew the spirit of our minds. Help us to receive your word and walk in it. And may it change us. Bind and break all the powers of darkness. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. And Lord, guide me and speak through me. I give you all the glory and praise as I am your servant. Ready to serve your children your meal. Amen. So, we got to get right into it, y'all. Originally, I was going to make this a series because there's so many different attributes to this amazing, life-changing message. But I'm actually excited to condense it, which means I'm going to give you a lot of scriptures. I'm not going to read them all. It's for you to be mature and responsible enough. You should have your notepad. You should have a pen. You should have your mighty sword. You should have the Lord with you. Be focused and let's go. This is a class, okay? When you tune in, it's a classroom. You got to remember something. This ministry is not a YouTube ministry. We are a ministry that happens to use YouTube as a weapon. You, you see where I'm going with that. So treat this as a classroom. Just a couple quick announcements that I want to tell you all about. A, um, thank you so much for all the emails. The emails are amazing. We may not be able to respond to every YouTube comment and, um, you know, but we read them and we love y'all so much. Y'all are just so blessed. <laughs> My wife and I believe we have some of the most powerful brothers and sisters on the planet in this ministry. Um, and more and more of y'all are waking up and becoming partners to the ministry and we just want to say we love you guys. Thank you for all your continual prayer and support. Showing your love by your actions and your deeds. Living for Christ. Communicating with us. Being a part of this family. Because let me tell you something. As we're getting closer to this last hour. You're going to desperately need Christ more than you've ever needed him. And you're going to desperately need true saints of God that you can lean on. It's hard to find people, I'm telling you. So many false prophets out right now. So many false leaders, even musicians. You know what I'm saying? Gospel artists. And it's become so disgustingly filled with wolves and sheep's clothing and snakes in the grass. And so we do have a series coming out, Lord willing, be on the lookout for it. It's called Judgment Must Begin. I do want to share with y'all. There's been visions that we've been getting of a lot of things that's coming down the road. So please live a life of prayer and fasting. Study to show yourself approved. You're doing this for you. You're not doing this to please nobody. You're not doing this to earn respect from nobody. You are doing this because you desperately need this. You desperately need to get as close to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as close to Him as you can. Trust me, brothers and sisters. Okay, so thank you so much for just loving the Lord and loving us and being a part of this movement. If you happen to be new to this ministry uh, and didn't know about us or new to this YouTube channel, or maybe you've been following us for a long time, but you you never considered joining the fight and helping this ministry, go to theghettogospel.com, click the contact, and get in this fight support be a part of this fight okay we're running out of time so anyways here we go the the wine of god huh so we're gonna condense this message so that way we can just release it in one message 
I'm telling you, there's so many nuggets and so many mysteries about this topic. And you know what's interesting? I believe that there has been a satanic agenda when it comes to wine, where the average church-going Christian almost looks at wine as an evil thing. But I want to have a healthy balance with you. Now, where I'm going with this is totally different than what I'm starting off with. Okay, um, the real message, <laughs> the amazing meaty side of this message is the spiritual revelations that the Lord has revealed in his mercy and grace about the spiritual wine of God. However, I want to start with the basic foundation because there's a lot of y'all that struggle with alcoholism. There's some of you who don't have any alcoholic problem, but you hit us up and say, hey, am I allowed to drink wine? I mean, I just don't know, Brother Words, Lioness. Can y'all uh, let me know what does the scriptures say? And, and some of y'all have family members that are complete alcoholics, but yet they claim to be Christians. And so, you know, this is a great message. Uh, it's a life-changing message. So first off, we're going to go through two parts in the beginning. We're going to talk about the scripture where it talks about drunkards will go to hell, period. We're going to move and transition into scriptures where you're actually allowed to drink wine. When you're allowed by the Lord, he will lead you. And then um, we're going to slowly move into the spiritual aspect of the message. Amen. I want to start by saying in Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians 8, if you read those two chapters, Paul breaks it down very well about try your best not to cause a brother or sister to stumble. And this is the reason, or, or in, in food or drink, he says. This is the reason why I wanted to start off with the meat, the milky side of this message, which is the, the actual conversation of literal wine. Even though we're going to be talking about spiritual wine, I wanted to dive into this to give a lot of y'all peace of mind, hope through Christ and encouragement and also knowledge. Amen. Um, and please, again, just just respect these messages as holy and sacred because it's not something that comes from here. It's something that's birthed out of my spiritual belly and flows like a river of living water from the Holy Ghost in hopes to change you. Amen. So the word alcohol, although um, there is a word in Arabic actually that's called al -Kul. And it's a body-eating demon. Now, just for the record, because, you know, we, we preach to a whole lot of different people. We got the Pharisees in the very back of the room, hiding behind the bushes, trying to hope I fall or stumble so they could point at me and say, Aha, but you're kicking against the thorns. The Lord Jesus Christ is my defense. So just as a disclaimer, um... I'm mentioning the Arabic name, but of course, Islam, Muslims need to repent and believe Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and come out of Islam and go into the ancient Christianity movement. Hallelujah. So, but I found that interesting how alcohol, -hal, right? And alcohol clearly destroys the body. So I found that interesting. Um, so we're going to dive right into it. Write these down now. Ephesians 5.18. Hallelujah. I'm excited to be at the dinner table. Appreciate all the love y'all been showing us. Um, the comments and the videos and stuff. And, and um, you know, listen, y'all. Um, oh, 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 wait, wait. I forgot to tell y'all uh, a couple of announcements just real quick before we get into uh, Ephesians. Partners. You, uh, within a week, uh, be on the lookout. You're going to get an email with a private message. Very, very, very powerful, life-changing message. And also, a unreleased song. Be on the lookout for those two things. Don't email me in two days talking about, brother, I didn't get it. Just give us some time. We'll send it to you. Okay? I just want to say that to all our partners out there. And the other thing, there was one more thing I wanted to tell y'all about, but it's not coming to my mind. Um, but if it comes, I'll just, you know me, I'm just going to talk it. But anyways, 
So let's get it in. So now, Ephesians, y'all there. Y'all probably there. Y'all already beat me. Ephesians 5.18, it says, be not drunk. Let me let me get there. I was just trying to paraphrase it. I'm going to paraphrase a lot and, and just to save time, okay? So Ephesians 5.18, it says in Jesus' name, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. You see that? So Paul is saying, don't get drunk in excess with the wine. But be filled with the Spirit. You, see, you follow. Now, Proverbs, I'm not going to read these. They're very amazing. But I want you to read them on your own time. I'm going to give you a couple. Um, Proverbs 23. Read the whole chapter. Um, really, there's too many. Proverbs talks a lot about alcoholism. There's a scripture where it talks about how it moves right in the glass. But it strikes that like a serpent. You know what I'm saying? Um, read Proverbs. It's going to give you a lot of wisdom on watching out for alcohol, that alcoholic demon, right? That drunkard spirit, right? So, um, and also remember that it's not only a drunkard spirit, but it becomes idolatry because in essence, people go to the bottle for comfort and ease to, to put away. But Jesus said, the Holy Ghost is our comforter. You see, so you're lifting up alcohol. That's a dangerous thing. And it's going to send you to hell if you don't repent. So we're going to do a special prayer at the end of the message. And I hope, okay, that you'll even come back to this video after doing some prayer and fasting. So that way the demon gets yanked out. But anyways, so we gave you some Proverbs. Isaiah 56, 12, write that down. Now this is interesting. A bishop now. In 1 Timothy, Paul breaks down part of the office. Let me just get there so I can show y'all. So 1 Timothy 3, verse 1 going down, it says in Jesus' name, This is a true saying, if a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, sober, Amen. A good, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, nor a striker. As far as I find it interesting because a lot of time when people get drunk, they become violent. But he's saying a bishop can't drink at all. That's interesting because when I was meditating on that, and it's, it's funny because another brother actually texted me. The same scripture a day later, and it was just confirmation. I was meditating on it. I'm like, Lord, there got to be some reason. How come you said a deacon can have a little bit of wine, but a bishop ain't allowed to? That's when it hit me in Ezekiel chapter 44, um, in particular verse 21. It goes on to say that a priest in the inner court is not allowed to have wine at all. So I kind of paralleled that, like a bishop got a deeper responsibility. You see what I'm saying? So God don't treat everybody the same. I know these people want to tell you that, but it's not true. Jesus did not treat the Pharisees the same way he treated his disciples. And even his disciples, he had the Peter, James, and John, who he took privately to show more deeper revelations secretly. I hope you want to be the Peter, James, and Johns. Amen. So... That is what I got out of that revelation, how a bishop is not allowed to drink because he's kind of like a priest type character for the New Testament believers. Now, again, there's a lot of scriptures on alcoholism. Um, go to Galatians 5. This is the one I was telling you about. Um, I just want to read it real quick to you. Okay, let me... Trying to turn the page like sat down is not, not working. I got to pick it up and skim through the pages. Praise God. So follow me as I follow Christ. We're going to get right into Galatians. Okay. And we're going to go to 5. Galatians 5 and 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleansliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, envying, murders, drunkenness. 
You see that? Revilings as such like of the which I tell you before as I've also told you in times past. They which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Period. You know, we've had people ask us these questions and that's why we wanted to give this first before we get into the uh, amazing revelation of this, this, this message. Now, me myself, me myself, when I was in the world... Uh, many, many years ago, I'm now 17 years into the Lord, saved, hallelujah, my wife going on 14 years, like, the time just went by so fast, but I remember weed was my thing when I was lost, um, you know, I wasn't really a drinker, and I think it had a lot to do with just because I didn't like the hangover feeling, and I didn't like not being... You know, I'm from the streets where you kind of had that, you know what I mean? Not like a paranoia, but, you know, when you with the goons, you with the hustlers, you with the gangsters, you don't know what's going to pop off. So you kind of don't want to be like, and see one of your enemies and not be able to do nothing. Or wake up in a prison cell, you know what I mean, for something you don't remember doing. Like, I, I couldn't see. So it kind of, I didn't, I was a social drinker. But there's a lot of people I knew who were, my, half my family was alcoholics. And, and some are still alcoholics. Uh, even my mom, I love her so much. Uh, you know, the Lord gave me confirmation that she made it to heaven when she passed away. But she used to get drunk off the coffee, brandy, like every other night. Although she worked hard, you know what I'm saying? And in many ways, she was a good mom. But when it came to spirituality and teaching us Christ and certain things, you know, she failed. But I, I don't hold that against her. But she had an alcoholic spirit. And uh, it was rough to see a woman that you love so much transform and become a different person. And get hateful and angry and hurt. And, you know, the crazy thing is, is I believe that... When people get drunk, they the wounds bleed out, right? The wounds bleed out, and they're hurting inside. So they ah, they throw bottles around the house, and you know. And one of the most glorious things I've ever seen in deliverance was my wife being delivered. And I don't want to get too deep. I'd rather her give her own testimony. But let me tell you something. It was amazing. But it took my wife immediately just did not want to do the things in the world anymore like it was almost like a fresh wind blew through her life when we met because she knew okay this is what it is i've been missing jesus this whole time i've been drinking in depression trying to hide the pain no he's what i need and she was just fired up for the lord a a a amazing amazing so i had to bring all that up because you know, I, I couldn't say I know what it's like to be an alcoholic. But God will give the wisdom how to help y'all. Any y'all out there that love the Lord but you're struggling with the bottle. There's hope for you. If I could get delivered from marijuana, if my wife can get delivered from cigarettes and alcoholism and marijuana, you can be delivered by the power of the Holy Ghost. So I just want to give that word of encouragement and you can contact us. You know our website by now, okay? If I don't get back to you within the first week, don't take it personal, okay? We got a lot of people that email us, not only within the country, but internationally as well. We, A lot of y'all don't know, but we run ministry in Africa too. We have ministry work we do faithfully in Africa. So there's a lot of behind the scenes things that y'all just don't know because we don't do do we don't toot our own horn. We do this for the glory of Christ. You feel me? And shout out to y'all that just step up and help us with the weight. You know what I'm saying? The Bible says share each other's burdens. Some of y'all are just so blessed. Um, y'all know who you are. But anyways, so here we are. We're talking about they shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. If you go to Luke 21, 34, what the Lord says, let's just go there. I'm already there. You better hurry up. I'm on the move. You know what I'm saying? 
21, 34. Look at what the King of Kings says in Jesus' name. And take heed to yourself, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with what? Surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life so that they come upon you unaware. What is surfeiting? It's overeating, y'all. Drunkenness and the cares of this life. Notice that the cares of this life will usually be the the foundation of what the devil uses to get people to get drunk and overeat. They get sad and depressed about the things going on in their life in the world. So they go to food and alcohol as a way out, as a comforter. But you better be careful not to provoke the Lord to anger because the only comforter you should have in your life is not a cigarette, not weed, not pills, not alcohol. It's the Holy Ghost. Amen. So Jesus said, and listen, some of y'all might look at the drunk that comes staggering in on Sunday, hurting, he's in pain, or she's in pain, she can't, she feels like she can't quit, and you guys, you talk behind her back or behind the guy's back, you look down on him, but he loves the Lord, she loves the Lord, she wants to get delivered, but what about some of y'all that overeat? Jesus says surfeiting and drunkenness. So you can put down the drunk. But you at the crib killing cake like it's going out of style. Chocolate falling on your chin. Talk about, oh, look at him defiling his body. Well, what you think diabetes come from? So let's not be hypocritical. You know what I mean? Like I say, I say it a lot. There's too many Christians that sit in the back in the bushes and wait for you to do something wrong. We got people that follow this ministry that hate us. <laughs> Every video, they watch it and they just hope they can find something on us to point and go, ha ha, I found something. That's pathetic. You know what I'm saying? So they did it to Christ. So we're going to have people that do it to us. It is what it is, y'all. My point is, be careful how you judge. You have to judge righteous judgment, the Bible says. And treat them. Encourage them. Tell them about this message. You know what I'm saying? Pray with them and tell them they can be delivered from that alcoholic demon, from idolatry and from depression. Usually alcoholism is, is, is friends with depression, rejection and hurt and pain and wounds. People, I mean, anyways. So... Romans 13 as well, if you can go there just real quick. Like I said, I'm not going through a thousand of them. If I got to go through 50 scriptures on why you can't get drunk, there's a problem. You know what I'm saying? That, that's a problem. So Romans 13, um, go to verse 13. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And make no provision for the flesh for to fulfill the lust thereof. See that? So clearly, I had to go this route first as a foundation. Because I don't want none of y'all saying, Brother Works gave me the green light to cop a bottle of wine. I did not. Matter of fact, if you really want to know, you have to be led by the Lord. We use wine for communion. Um, there's some Christians. Uh, we got a chef from up north. Who cooks wine with his meal. He he can cook a pasta meal with wine. <laughs> I mean, look, y'all. If you knew that, just like food now. Remember Jesus said surfeiting, overeating, and wine can damn somebody. Right? Food is not evil. Right? I mean, food is not evil. For the most part, right? Unless it's like some kind of genetically creeped out like human DNA stuff. But you get my point. That's not what it is. It's when the demon comes in of addiction. And you can't, a person can't stop eating. That's where it becomes demonic. So the same thing applies with wine. Wine itself is not evil. But if someone's hitting the cups every single day talking about, I'm a Christian, I can have me some wine. Jesus, turn the water in the wine, get your party on it. <laughs> nah, you better chill. Especially, let me tell you something. 
when you look at this as a whole, right? This is plain, straight down the middle. We're cutting it with the word of God so there's no confusion. Before we get into the main part of the message, which I'm ecstatic for. Matter of fact, I'm trying to rush through this beginning part because I want to get into the meat. But we got to go with this first, okay? Because y'all remember, we deal with all different type of people. We deal with newborn babes who just got saved. We deal with people that, oh, geez, that already know this. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, be patient. By the way, I want to give a special thank you to all our partners who were patient with me. As I was, like, the last three videos, I had to spend, like, 15 minutes in the beginning of the videos explaining why we have to put certain sermons aside, okay? Uh, look, y'all, we're going to get Pharisees that just look for reasons to try to stone us, okay? My job is not to please them. My job is to please God. But I want to give people the benefit of the doubt so they don't speak evil of a true servant of the Most High God. You feel me? So anyways, I just want to say thank you for being patient. That it wasn't really intended for a lot of y'all. The messages in the beginning were intended for the those that hate Christ but follow us. Because they just want to find something on us. Uh, or Pharisees. Or religious people that try to use this ministry. So there was a lot of different reasons why we had to give those little 10 minute messages before the sermon. You feel me? So... Anyways, special thank you. I just want to say thank you for that. So now we establish where clearly alcoholism is 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 an evil thing, right? And how it's it's the idolatry of it, right? The a lot of people have an addictive personality disorder that comes from a demon where, you know, you can't just have a half a glass of wine, you know, once every few weeks with a steak meal. Yeah, well, you know, people just, they have one little half a glass, which should be permissible. I'm not talking about a glass like this. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, little glasses and they got the little, you know what I mean? These little half of it. It's just to taste and enjoy the steak. Now, some people have asked me that. Like, yo, what's up? Can I, why well, I can't have a half a glass of wine with my meal, brother? And I say, well, that depends. If you had a strong alcoholic background, you might not be ready for that. You might have to do communion with grape juice instead of wine. Now, we use wine for our communion because we ain't battling that spirit. That ain't in us. You understand the difference? So, and of course, just for the record, all alcoholic beverages, Bacardi, Yang Ming, vodka, Henny, all of that, it's all, all wicked. That's why if you notice a lot of the liquor stores will say fine wine and spirits, right? Don't let them lie to you. The word spirits is being, is deliberate. It's literal is what I'm trying to say. They'll say, oh, spirits means happy. No, 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 no. The devil wants legal ground into your life. So when, if, if a person goes into that store, they, they're already told by the sign, they getting liquor and spirits with it. So we condemn all them hard liquors and all of that. Don't even email me with that trash. I'm just talking about wine, which is biblically biblically sound. Let's get it. Y'all ready? So now we're going to go into scriptures where wine is permissible. One of the ones we're going to really tap into is the Gospel of John chapter 2 when Jesus goes to the wedding. Okay? Um, but we're not going to get there yet. Nehemiah chapter 13, 12. I want you to write that down. That's just one out of so many in the Old Testament where God, I mean, God mentioned wine a lot. Wine and oil. Bring the wine into the storehouse, he said, right? Um, but we're going to go to Luke uh, chapter 7 real quick. I want you to get there. Chapter 7 of Luke. 7.33. Y'all there? In Jesus' name. Check what it says now. 7.33. In Jesus' name. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say he got a devil. The Son of Man is come eating and drinking, and you say, Behold, a gluttonous man, a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of all her children. 
there's a reason why Christ said that. They must have seen him. I mean, he did communion with the wine. When he passed that communion around, it wasn't Mott's apple juice. It was, they didn't have that, that um, excuse me, uh, grape juice. It was wine. So this is the curse of the Pharisee. Is they're not happy either way. They call John a devil and they call Jesus a devil. Like that is dangerous. Some of y'all got to slow down. Always trying to just think you know everything. And you just waiting. You looking at people. You trying to find something on them. You better be careful. You better be looking in the mirror. Making sure you ain't got something here. You feel what I'm saying? So here Jesus said, hey, you got something to say to me? Who knows why they said that? Um, we could just go based off of John 2 when he turned the water into wine. And some will say, well, that was non-alcoholic, brother. Where is that in the scripture? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, do you know the only word for wine that is in the, in the Bible, when it talks about wine, it's fermented grapes. So can all of that. These are just, see, there's two extremes that are dangerous. You got the extreme to the far right, which are Christians that are headed to hell. They're drunks. They drink every day. It's become a god to them. The al cool spirit is eating them on the inside. But they think they're Christian. They're, I, I believe in Jesus. Just, ooh, I just drink a six-pack every day. I work hard. I come home. What do you want from me? Nah, bruh. Nah, sister. You better realize you headed somewhere dangerous. Get it out. Lay it on the altar like Abraham did to Isaac. Get rid of it. Because God got a greater wine for you. Amen. He got a spiritual wine that we're going to talk about. Oh, I love this message. Right? But then you got Christians on the far left who are so legalistic and so... Ah, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Where they've made wine altogether heresy. And I believe one of the main reasons why you will not hear a message like this is because wine has been, you know, made into a villain. You wouldn't really get a revelation like this unless the Holy Ghost would give it. And thank God he gave it to me to give to y'all. All praises to Christ, the chef. Amen. I'm telling you guys are going to love this message. And we're going to do a great prayer at the end, led by Christ. And I'm so grateful. But now we went to Luke 7. Okay, now 1 Timothy, where we were just at about the bishop, I want you to see this now. Remember, Paul said, hey, bishop, you can't drink it all. But what did he say? Go to chapter 3 again. About the deacon. Now, a deacon is a different office or position in the, in the church, right? Look what he says. Likewise, the deacons must be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy. You, now, hold on a minute. He didn't say, deacons, don't you dare drink that wine. He said, you're not supposed to have a lot of it. Because, see, what a lot of y'all don't know is there was a time when water was kind of scary to drink. Because of sanitary issues. So a lot of people drank wine. And what they would do is they would dilute the wine with water. You know what I'm saying? And so that way they didn't get drunk. But they would drink wine. <laughs> I mean, y'all, this is a great message. So here a deacon can have a little bit of wine. He just can't be wilding out. He got to represent himself godly, abstain from all appearance of evil. You see what I'm saying? There was a time where um, we we had to do communion and uh, we got the matzo crackers or whatever, bread works, you know what I'm saying? And uh, I needed to get a bottle of wine. But I, I said, Lord, give me wisdom because I was on Main Street driving and you know, it was like the flesh was like, there's an alcohol, uh, there's a liquor store. They got wine. Go in there and get it. No, no, no. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Because what if somebody who knows me as a man of God sees me coming out that liquor store? They ain't going to know that that wine is, is for communion or cooking an Italian dish or something crazy as some of y'all do. They're going to th they're gonna say what? Oh, shoot. Brother Works is on that joint. You know what I'm saying? He on that liquor. 
See how crazy it is? So you got to be wise with this. You got to make sure you represent, like he said to the deacon, you better represent yourself godly, sound, in doctrine. So there's a way to do things. So anyways, um, but God is good. I was able to get wine from a more of a marketplace. I think it was Trader, was it Trader Joe's and one of them places. And it was with a bunch of other groceries. And I was even telling the cash register about the Lord and how you got to do communion. And see, there's a way to do things, y'all. Um, but anyways, uh, but that, that's not for everybody. Some of y'all got to stick to the grape juice. Because you're not strong enough and mature enough yet. And some of y'all are. You have to take that to the Lord. Okay? Don't cause yourself to stumble trusting in your own flesh. If you've only been delivered three months ago from alcoholism, you're like, no, brother, I'm sanctified king's kid. I'm going to go get me a bottle of wine. You better be careful. You better ask the Lord. Amen. Now, Genesis 14 is when Melchizedek brought wine and bread to Abraham. That was literal wine. So I'm going somewhere with this, y'all. Go to 1 Timothy. Now go to chapter 5. I want to show you something here. Verse, look at what he says in verse 23. He says, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake, and you're often infirmities. See, Paul didn't even realize at that time, good, we're making good time. At that time, wine, you know, don't, you know, not a five dollar bottle that's all bootleg and not the best uh, health wise, but Decent quality wine can have a lot of antioxidants. It can be actually good for the body. Now, Paul didn't know that. He didn't know about antioxidants. But he was telling Timothy, hey, you know that sickness or whatever that is that you've been going through, put a little wine. Not, not Just a little bit. Half a cup. You know what I mean? Not a cup like this. You know, like a little glass. Put a little wine in you. It'll help your stomach, Timothy. Ain't that banana? Now, there's a spiritual uh, um, interpretation to that that we're going to get into after. So, I'm going to stop there. I think we've fairly balanced both. Hold on. I had to turn the AC off, man. You know what I'm saying? We in the South, it's still kind of hot down here, but that AC was stuck on freezer. I'm like, yo, know, felt like a slab of turkey bacon in the fridge, you know what I mean? But, um, so check this out. So, that's a fair balance. I, I'm, I'm trusting that you, you understand the fair balance, right? First off, you have to deal with you personally with the Lord. What is your background? We got to also break the generational curse of alcoholism that comes through. A, I mean, man, it was heavy in my family. You know what I'm saying? So we're going to deal with that. Okay. But now I want to move on to the next segment. It's about to heat up. Y'all ready? Y'all ready? Y'all ready? It's about to go. It's about to get heavy. I'm telling you, this message changed our life. And I know it'll change yours if you're in the beloved. So, the next segment I want you to write down in this condensed mini, you know, um, series put into one video is called Too Drunk to Know the Difference. Write that down. Too Drunk to Know the Difference. I want you to go with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 2. Mbili. Number 2 in Swahili is Mbili. Or dos in, in Spanish, right? I hope I'm saying it clean and crisp. Just trying to sound smart, really. I'm just keeping it real, you know what I'm saying? Just, just. Anyways, y'all there. John chapter 2. Y'all know the story. Jesus is invited to a wedding. Now, Jesus wasn't hitting the block everywhere. Just, uh, hey, hey, y'all want some wine? Uh. This was a wedding. This was a fun time. A celebration. Some of y'all put a box over God and tell God what he can and can't do. 
be careful. Be careful. Okay. Now let's go ahead and read this. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine. The mother of Jesus said unto him. They have no wine. Jesus said unto her woman. What have I to do with thee? My hour is not yet come. His mother said unto the servants. Whatsoever he says do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus said unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew the governor of the feast called the bridegroom. Now stop right there. We got to tap into something real quick. This is amazing. So now you got these big six water pots, right? Empty. Here's my quick little nugget on that mystery right there. The Bible says a day with the Lord is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. From Adam to Christ biblically is six, uh, excuse me, four thousand years. From Christ to us is approximately two thousand years or six days or six thousand years. Now that doesn't mean the earth is six thousand years old or the galaxy is six thousand years old. No, that does not have to mean that. But biblical human time frame, okay? Notice that we're, we're at six days or 6,000 years, which Christ is at the door. Because the seventh day represents the Sabbath or the reign of Christ. Could it be that the six pots transforming into, into wine, the water into wine, represents Jesus' blood covering every generation of the six days or the 6,000 years. Past, present, and future. In other words, his blood can cover anybody whosoever willeth, the Bible says. So those in the Old Testament, David and the patriarchs and Abraham, and they got under the blood of Jesus. They were allowed into heaven. The people currently in his time, the disciples and those that repented and believed would make it into heaven under his blood. And us in the future, here we are 2,000 years later, we are covered by his blood. So the six pots that turn into wine, because the wine is symbolic to his blood, represents the covering of the entire human race. That doesn't mean everybody gets saved. It just means everybody had an opportunity. Wow. Lord. So anyways, that was a side nugget that I could have made into another sermon, but I kind of like how I threw it in here. What I want to talk about is the too drunk to know the difference. Now look what the governor says. He said unto him, every man at the beginning does set forth the good wine. And when men have well drunk... Then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. And this was the beginning of miracles, did Jesus in Canaan, Canaan of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Now pause, basically the governor said, now on the low, Jesus was a real governor, can I get an amen? But on the low, the governor was really saying the truth. A lot of times, <laughs> the, at, at like a wedding back then, because there wasn't a whole lot of people balling, you know what I'm saying? They would bring out expensive, good quality wine. And after people was hitting it, you know what I mean? And having a celebration. And hey, congratulations, man. Y'all beautiful couple, man. You know what I'm saying? They would slip in the bootleg wine in the box. <laughs> you know that box wine they be selling? You got to pump it. I, what video, what movie did I see that in? Um, anyways, they would slip in the bootleg wine because the people would be too drunk to know the difference. That's when the revelation hit me, like a ton of bricks. I don't know about you, but I feel so grateful and rich 
to have these type of messages given to us. He's good, ain't he? So, this next segment called Too Drunk to Know the Difference. Write that down. Now, interesting enough, Proverbs 31, read that on your own time, especially verse 4 to 7. Okay, where it talks about how they get so drunk they don't even know what's going on, right? I want you to write down these these chapters in Revelation, although I'm just going to go to one of them. Revelation 14, 8 through 10. Revelation 16, verse 19. Revelation 17, verses 1 through 2. And Revelation 18, verse 3. Now, let's just go to Revelation 14, shall we? Y'all going to love this. I'm telling you, this is a heavy word. That's why I was like, Lord, you want, you, you want me to release this public? Half these people don't even appreciate you. God said, release it. And shout out to y'all that appreciate. Amen. We love y'all very much. So y'all there. Y'all beat me. Revelation 14, verse 8. Look at what it says. It says in Jesus Christ's name. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she had made all nations, what? Drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So wait a minute. God has his spiritual wine and Satan got his nasty stank boxed wine. Some of y'all already see where I'm going with this. Go to Jeremiah 51 verse 7. Follow me as I follow Christ. Let's go. We got to move quick, y'all. I'm, I'm trying to bring all this together. Jeremiah 51. Y'all there? Jeremiah 51, verse 7 in Jesus' name. All that found them have devoured them. And their adversaries said, We offend not because they have sinned against the Lord, the habitation of the justice, even the Lord, the hope of their... I'm in 51. I apologize. I'm bugging. 51. Now let's try this again now. Verse 7. Babylon had been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken her wine. Therefore, the nations are mad or crazy. You see that? So, and again, we can go on and on and on and on. But I think you get the point. And then it hit me. I was meditating on this. You remember in, in uh, Samuel? Well, you know, let me not go to there. Not, let me talk about Hannah yet. But you remember when the Israelites came from the land of the giants? What did they carry with them? Giant grapes. I seen a, like, there was a deep revelation there about how the Nephilim got their wine. You know, the Antichrist has his wine. The whore of Babylon, the beast, is getting all the nations drunk with her wine. You see that? That's when it hit me. The same thing the governor said, how people get so drunk, they can no longer tell between good wine and bad wine. That's when it hit me. People are so drunk with the wine of this antichrist system. Babylon, false prophets and ministries, false ministries. They're so drunk with the wine of the great whore. They can't tell the difference between a good ministry and an evil ministry. A true prophet of the Lord and a false prophet. They just... <clears throat> Stagger around, going on YouTube, learning from everyone, everything, all these different types of people. They got this, this new false prophet that I just found out about. He just left Atlanta, right? Uh, they call him Jesus Christ. This flamboyant, silver, you know, jacket on, uh, uh, Joshua something. God is going to crush him if he don't stop. You need to pray for that young Effeminate boy. You better pray for the people that are under his spell. One woman said, if you don't see he's a prophet, you ain't got the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, Lord Jesus, please come quickly. But I'm telling you, they can't tell the difference. Now, I was meditating on this. And all of a sudden, it's like Lot dropped. And I started thinking about Lot. Go to Genesis 19 real quick. 
Genesis 19. Now you read that on your own time. But basically his daughters. Now remember Lot came out of Sodom and Gomorrah. Homosexuality. Incest. Bestiality. LGBT. All up in there. Right? And that spirit was still up in him. When he left. See you need to come up out of the world. But is the world coming up out of you? That's a t-shirt slogan right there. <laughs> That's a t-shirt slogan right there. But. They, the daughters conspired to get him drunk because they didn't know if they would ever have children. They just seen the city destroyed. They didn't know what was going on. He was so drunk, he didn't know he was laying down with his daughters. I mean, that's nasty. Now, don't email me talking about peace and blessings. I am a Muslim and exactly, brother, this is why I don't believe Jesus, the Bible, because men of God slept with daughters. Who said Lot was a man of God? Lot wasn't no man of God. Lot wasn't like Abraham. Lot lived on a strength of Abraham. You know what I'm saying? So, don't get it twisted. But my point is, he was too drunk to know the difference. Which, I'm sorry, how do you get that drunk? But, Lord have mercy. You know what I mean? Like, I'm thinking lost in the world. But then again, let's keep it real though. Some of y'all sisters... When you was lost in the world, man, you woke up with the 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 creature from the Black Lagoon. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you woke up with the thing in in, in your bed. You, ah! Oh, you, I mean, you prayed and didn't even know how to pray. Just Jesus, did I did, did I Jesus? Oh yeah, I'm I'm quit. I repent, Jesus. I'm I repent. Jesus. Ah, Jesus. <laughs> Some of y'all fellas too. Some of y'all fellas. Took one for the team when you was lost in the world drunk. You know what I'm saying? A man. Oh, man. I thank God we got saved out the world. Man, the world is grimy. The world is nasty. But my point is, you don't want to get intoxicated with the wine of Babylon to the point where you don't know the difference. Between the true voice of God and another voice. A true uh, prophet and a false. You know, God gave us peace of mind in this ministry. Because I say, Lord, Lord, like, how could people not see the, the fruit in this ministry? How could they try to war against true servants of the Most High God? They too drunk, he said. They don't, they don't, they, they, they drunk with the wine of Babylon. They don't know you're my servant. They're looking at you as an enemy. Jesus said they will kill you thinking they're doing God's service. I hope that encouraged some of y'all and also convicted some of y'all. You learning from the wrong people, you're going to get hit with that, that Babylonian spiritual wine. Get it out of your soul and we're going to do a prayer about that after. All right. We got we to gotta get it in now. Now, this is the main part of the message. This is where it gets real personal, intimate. I've already weeped, so I'm going to have more strength to give this to you because it hit me hard. It hit me hard when I first was in meditation about this. I was broken. when I, when I This gave me a whole another level of the love and respect for Christ and for communion or what we would call the Lord's table, Right? When he, so let's actually go there. So Matthew 26, this is where Jesus, uh, write that down, 27 and 29, the verse. And this is where Jesus says, take this, eat this in, in remembrance of me. This is my body with the bread, right? And what did he say the wine was? It, this is my blood. This is such a good word. This is my blood. For the new covenant, right? The new testament. Drink this as often in remembrance of me, he said. Now the Catholics, that they don't have what we have. The Eucharist and all the... Catholicism is not Christianity. If you are a Catholic, you need to come out. You need to renounce the Pope. You need to follow Christ. Okay? We're talking true communion here. Okay? Now... I found the interesting parallel with Genesis 14 where Christ is Melchizedek, just for some of y'all that don't know that, the priest that met with Abraham. What did he have in his hands? He had wine and bread. It was communion. Isn't that amazing? He did communion with Abraham, and then thousands of years later, he's doing communion with Abraham's great, 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 great grandchildren. 
You know what I'm saying? I mean, Christ is so amazing. So now I'm meditating on this. I'm just like, okay, Lord, there's got to be a spiritual aspect to wine because you mentioned this so much in the Old Testament. Even when God told them to do certain offerings, sometimes wine was involved. It's amazing. So now, this is where it dropped on me. Jesus Christ talked about eat my flesh and drink my blood. And a lot of people ran away from him when he said that because they didn't understand the spiritual aspect of it. But what happened in Gethsemane, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he is trembling on his face, trying to avoid something. Remember? He said, if it be your will, let this cup what? Pass from me. But then meditating on it, you go to Luke twenty two forty four, 44, write that down. And what does it say? It says, as he was praying in the garden of Gethsemane, it was as if he had literal sweat of great drops of blood. What was going on here? How do you read all of this and just go, hey man, next chapter. So he's in the garden of Gethsemane and there's so much pressure going on. It's like he's sweating out great drops of blood and he's trying to avoid something, but... Nevertheless, it was his father's will that mattered and not his own. Wow. I want to be just like Christ. Don't you? And don't you want Christ to be through you? Y'all ready for it? Y'all ready for the powerhouse revelation? All glory to the Holy Ghost. Gethsemane means... The crushing place or the wine press. Now remember the subtitle for this message was, was what? The day God crushed his son or crushed Jesus. So wait a minute. That's when it hit me like a ton of bricks. <sighs> Man. I don't want to move too fast. I want to go over one more segment. I want you to write down wine and oil. Throughout the whole New Te Old Testament, wine and oil are like hand in hand. God says, bring the wine, bring the oil. Get the wine, get the oil. Throughout the whole Old Testament, God is talking like this, right? And I even wrote down scriptures, not a whole lot, because that's just, I mean, after five, do you really need seven or eight of them? But Revelation 6.6 6 says, hurt not the oil or the what? The wine. Write down Exodus 29.40. Haggai 1.11. Deuteronomy 18.4. And Joel 2.24. Now the one I want us to read is Psalms 104. But before we read that, I want to talk about Luke 10 about the good Samaritan, which you need to read on your own time. I'm going to paraphrase it. The man was wounded and beaten and robbed and hurt. Jesus, who is the good Samaritan, comes over and he pours two specific things into the wounds for healing. What were they, brothers and sisters? The oil and the wine. The oil represents the Holy Spirit. The wine represents the blood of Jesus Christ. Write that down. Now this is going to blow your mind. Go to Psalms 104. Come on. Let's speed this up now. Psalms 104. Look at what it says. Psalms 104. Look at what verse 15 says in Jesus' name. And wine that maketh glad the heart of man, and oil to make his face to shine, and bread which strengthens the man's heart. Did you see the hidden revelation? The wine represents the blood, right? So the wine which is the blood makes the glad, glad the heart of man. Why? Because when we think of the blood of Jesus, we get excited because we're saved. It makes us glad. You see the revelation. 
the oil which makes the man's face to shine. What happened with Stephen when he got martyred? He said he had the face of an angel. The oil is the anointing of the Holy Ghost will shine out of our face. And the bread which gives strength to the person is the word of life. Isn't that amazing? So here you got the revelation. Of the good Samaritan, which is Jesus, pouring in his blood and the anointing of the Holy Ghost to bring healing to us. Some of y'all that have been struggling with alcoholism and depression, all that, you need the blood of Jesus and the anointing of the Holy Ghost and the word of God. Those are the three attributes. Those are the three things that heal you. You don't need alcohol to ease the pain. It don't ease the pain. It's a lie. It's like when somebody goes to the dentist, they get shot up with the numbness, they get drilled all. As soon as that, that numbness go away, they in pain at the crib. Why do you think the dentist prescribes you pain medication? It's a lie. You need the blood of the lamb, the Holy Ghost, and the word, the bread. Jesus is the bread. Wow. Wow. Let's, let's bring it all together now. Y'all are going to, this is going to blow you away. I started meditating on this. And I knew there was a missing link. There was something, and that's when the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, I want you to specifically study where grapes grow in Israel. Not anywhere else. He just wanted to show me Israel. And he actually revealed Isaiah chapter 5 to me. And if you read Isaiah chapter 5, it talks about grapes being grown on the, val the hill of the valleys. Oh, this is so good. So I wrote down word for word what th those living in Israel actually, they boast about wine. They're so proud of the wine that comes out of there and how ancient the traditions is and all of this, right? Um, which they need to get saved. They need the Messiah. Then they can rejoice in Christ. The uh, uh, I was about to slip and tell y'all you're going to have to wait. Don't be trying to get it out of me early. Now watch. Look at what they said as far as the best places to grow those gorgeous things right there. They said the best places grown on Rocky hills in the valley and poor soil. Come on. Come on. Are you for real? In rocky places in the hill of the valley and poor soil because it allows for the good drainage and plenty of sunlight. Can't you see why you're called, sister? Can't you see why you're called, brother? You from the rocky places, struggling in the valley, in poor soil. Went through the struggle your whole life. And that's when it hit me, Isaiah 53. Jesus is called a tender plant out of a dry ground. A dry ground is poor soil. Wow. But wait, there's more. I know that sounded totally infomercial. <laughs> but wait, there's more. I was like bathing in that revelation. And God said, I got something else. I continue to study about how they did things in Israel. What is the most ancient way to turn these into wine? Come on. A factory, brother. Yeah, you too modern, bro. Your feet. They would take... They would build a big squared inlay, right, with some form of like, you know, whatever it was back then. We, we know like plaster or cement or whatever, rocks. They would put all the grapes in it and they would step on the grapes and break the grapes and the gr grapes would bleed out. Some of y'all caught it. It would bleed out the juice. And as excited as I was to catch that revelation of that's what a wine press is. That's what the Garden of Gethsemane meant. It meant the wine press or the crushing place. God said, wait, keep studying. Come to find out, during the time of Christ, they actually were a little more sophisticated. And they would take a long wooden pressing bean. And lay it on top of the grapes and step on it. 
and the juice from the grapes would run down a man-made slope down the hill into a place called the fermentation pit. Immediately, I felt so rich and blessed because the revelation hit me like a ton of bricks. Did y'all, some of y'all caught it. A wooden beam. What did Christ die on? <laughs> My Lord. What did he die on? A wooden cross. What is the odds? He's in the Garden of Gethsemane, a place where grapes get crushed, right? And the wooden beam is laid on him called the cross and he's crushed and his blood comes out. My God. <sighs> but the blood, the grape juice goes down a hill into a fermentation pit. Where did Jesus go for three days and three nights? He went into the pits. Remember, he went to the he went against the he went to the grave against the wicked and the rich. He went into the pits of hell. My God, how do you handle a revelation like this? How do you get sermons like this and show no honor to the Holy Ghost and no honor to us in this ministry? How do you hear messages like this that change your life and be like, nah, I ain't supporting them? Like, that's crazy to me. You should want this ministry to reach millions of people. We're trying to save as many souls as we can with the real word. Not the phony word that's being preached to the four ends of the earth. No, no, no. The real gospel is preaching the truth of the word. This changed my life. Because now I'm seeing Jesus deeper than I've ever seen him. Jesus was the grapes, the tender plant given from God. And Jesus knew there would come a time where he would have a struggle. Where he would go to a place called Gethsemane, which is a wine press, knowing that when he goes there, somebody got to crush him. Now I know some of y'all are wondering... Well, who did it? Well, it's twofold. Clearly, men did it. And the whole human race has been charged with the murder of God's son. Just so you know that. Not just the Jews, not just the Romans. All of human race is judged by the murder of murdering Jesus Christ. That's why it's so terrifying not to be saved. Because on judgment day, I don't care how many sins a person has. The one sin that God has the most wrath in his eyes of fire is you killed my son. And you spit in his face and you did not accept his gift. That's a terrifying place to be on that day. You better love Christ and you better hold on daily and serve him and obey him and be the best you can for him. Because his father and our father is watching our every moves. Y'all ready for this? Go to Isaiah 53. Lord Jesus, this is heavy. Isaiah 53, Lord. This revelation had me crying, y'all. And just check this out. So Isaiah 53 verse 1, it says, Who had believed that report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? He shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He had no form of comeliness and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. You see, I told you about that. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. We hid as it was our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him smitten, stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and through his stripes, which is blood, we are healed. Grape. You see that? What comes out when you crush it? What comes out? 
through the crushing of Jesus Christ, his juice or blood from the heavenly grape heals us. But let's go down to verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, that's God the Father, right? It pleased the Lord to bruise him. That word there in the Hebrew means crush. So God the Father crushed Jesus Christ. I can't do this, Lord. Help me. Give me the strength to do this, Lord. Oh. God the Father. Could you imagine the conversation Jesus Christ and God the Father were having together in the Garden of Gethsemane? Here Jesus is, perfect, holy, righteous, in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he's saying, Father, if, if, if there's a way out, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. What was it Jesus Christ was trying to avoid? I'm here to tell you that Jesus Christ knew at that moment, I am in the wine press and I am the grapes. And I am going to get crushed in two different ways. I'm going to get crushed in the natural realm by the foot of men. Right? That's why in Hebrews it says they trampled under the foot the son of God. They cr they stepped on him. Not knowing they were doing what God wanted them to do anyways. They needed to crush him with the wooden beam. With the cross. To make him into wine. But God the father had to crush him. In the other dimension. And this was terrifying. Here Jesus is. He's got this revelation. And did you know that Gethsemane was at the foot of. Of Mount of Olive at the foot. See that revelation of the foot crushing Christ? Lord. This gave me a whole new appreciation for Christ. The suffering and the struggle he went through in that wine press, in that place where grapes are stepped on. God the Father himself had to crush his own son. He had to say, My son, it's hard for me to see this right now. I need to crush you because if I don't crush you, I can't turn you into wine for my children to get saved. I can't turn you into wine to save the rest of them. And as soon as the father said this to Jesus Christ, in his great love and mercy, he said, okay, father, crush me, crush me, crush me. And could you imagine the pain? Could you imagine what it was like for God the Father to crush his only, his, his only begotten son with his feet, to step on his son and allow the men to come in with Judas, the, 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 the Pharisees to falsely accuse him, all the people to cheer on to crucify him, trodden under the foot the Son of God, but Jesus Christ received peace and strength in that hour from his heavenly father because he knew I'm a grape now. But to save the rest of them, even the very same people that hate me, even the very same people that want me dead, I have to become, I have to become wine. I have to, I have to be sacrificed. My blood has, my body has to break like a grape. I have to be crushed by the wooden beam like they did to make wine. My blood, I have to run down into the pit of fermentation, which is three days and three nights in hell. Because I'm coming back from the dead as the wine of God. I was put on the earth as the grapes, a tender plant. But when I come back, I'm coming back as the wine of God. Book of Acts chapter 2. I want you to read that on your own time. But there was something interesting that was said there. 
in the book of Acts chapter 2, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. They started to speak in tongues. You know that you know it. You should know it. You better know it. But what did the unbelievers say mocking? Look at what it says. They mocked. They mocked in, in verse. Come on. Where is it? Verse 13. Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. Peter said, how could this be? It's but the third hour of the day and they were all silent. But what if I told you that even though those unbelievers were mocking in the physical realm saying, oh, these, these guys are just drunk. But they were actually speaking the truth in the spirit. God. They didn't even realize they were speaking prophetically, spiritually. Because the men of God and the women of God in the upper room got filled with the new wine. Oh, Lord. What did he say about... <laughs> Go to Matthew 9. Go to Matthew 9 real quick. Let's be quick now. We got to move. We got to get the prayer in. Matthew 9, 14 to 17. Look at what Jesus said now. He said, in Jesus' name, you know, go, go to 15. No, 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 16. We're going to cut straight to it. Can a man putteth a new piece of cloth into an old garment for that which is put into it, fill up and take up the other garment, and the rent is made worse? Neither do men put new wine into old bottles. Else the bottles break and the wine runs out and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles and both are preserved. This is why you're supposed to be born again. 2 Corinthians 5 says we are to be new creatures. If you're not born again, you cannot receive the wine of God and get saved. This is why. This is why you must be. This is why we push you to pray and fast and read and fellowship with us. And to live holy because you need to become a new creature creature to be the new wineskin to receive the wine of God which is the blood of Jesus Christ Lord Jesus and notice it's made out of a sacrifice animal skin that's what they made wineskins out of then we have to be a living sacrifice to get filled with the wine my God It pleased God to crush his son because he knew there was a greater purpose for this. Remember when Joseph was betrayed by his brothers, but he told them it's good it happened. It was for a greater purpose. Jesus Christ knew. He, he settled it in his heart. He said, okay, crush me. And at that moment, God the Father allowed Judas and the Roman guards and the Pharisees to beat the grape of God, Jesus Christ, to crush and bruise his skin and bring the juice out. This is why he had to die. And he has a greater revelation that just how wine, the longer you let it ferment, the stronger it becomes. The longer spiritually you let Christ ferment in you, the stronger he is in you. Some people wonder, like, words, how, how y'all get so much revelations? How did like, people get delivered? I tell them, because we've had time spent with Christ that he ferments in us. It's him, not us. Lord. I got one more revelation that I want to tell y'all. Do you remember when Jesus Christ took off his outer garment and he washed the disciples' feet? Remember that? If you remember in Hebrews chapter 10, 29, it says they trotted under the foot the Son of God. Now you know what that really means. They stepped on him in the wine press like grapes, right? I was meditating and I almost felt like my heart was broken. Because I felt like, man, we did this to Christ, God in the flesh. And worse, we did this to God the Father by treating his son this way. But it had to be done. That's when it hit me. This is when the Holy Spirit bubbled this out of me and it, it all came together. Jesus walked around. 
with the basin and the cloth or whatever it was. And he started to wash the disciples' feet and he came to Peter. And Peter said, nah, Lord, you can't do that. Jesus said, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you cannot be my disciple. He said, the whole body is clean, but the feet are dirty. Here's the revelation. Jesus has to wash their feet and our feet spiritually because it's what was used to, to, to crush God's son. This is the weapon. This is the murder weapon. The feet of men had to be washed from the judgment upon them. Oh, my God. Jesus. When a murder happens, the police look for the murder weapon. The feet of men were the murder weapon. We trodden under the foot the Son of God. All of human race has been judged guilty of this murder. Unless you repent and get saved, you're omitted out of it. Jesus Christ, when you receive him and you repent, he washes your feet like he did Peter because the feet got to get the judgment washed off of them. Lord. I'm done. I'm done, y'all. I'm done. For all our partners out there, there's a separate part of this message that's a little too deep for the public. I'm going to email it to y'all. Okay, you will get the separate. It has to do with the heel crushing Satan's head. There's a deep revelation there, but I'm not releasing that public. I don't feel led for our partners. You're going to get it in a separate video. Okay, in Jesus Christ's name. So... We bringing all this together. And you know what's amazing is you, you remember in the scripture where uh, it says in Luke 6 that it be pressed down, running over. There you got that pressing down juice running over, right? So it, it all comes together. But listen, saints, we are also grapes. We're no greater than our master. So when you're getting crushed, when you're going through hard times... Could it be that God is getting the juice out of you to make you wine? I remember Paul called himself Paul the Aged. Trouble me not. I'm, an old, I'm, I'm, I'm aged in this. Paul was a mighty fermented wineskin of wine. <laughs> all the beatings he had, all the suffering he went through. One of many. Plenty of men and women of God who suffered for the kingdom of Christ. And became an amazing wine. And got filled with the wine of God. So rejoice when you go through hard times. Because Christ got to crush you. Just like the father crushed him. He was the eternal sacrifice. But we have to, have a, we have to be a living sacrifice. He did it on the cross. But we got to go through hardships. There's going to be people that want to trot in us. Under their feet. So now you see why communion is so important. You better drink that blood. You better eat that flesh. According to John chapter 6. Don't you got a newer level of respect for Christ? Knowing what he went through. This is the son of God. Who was always in perfect peace. Love and unity with his father. From everlasting to everlasting. The father was always pleased with Christ. But yet at this moment, Jesus took on all the sins and had to get crushed to bruise the head of the serpent. The prophecy was fulfilled. A little extra nugget is in 1 Samuel when Hannah prayed and prayed and prayed for a son. And remember the priest thought she was drunk remember but she said I'm not see she had that spiritual wine it wasn't the blood of Jesus per se but she had a spiritual wine where God was moved to give her a child who'd grow up to be a mighty man of God do you want that spiritual wine brothers and sisters I want you to do this prayer with me this is this has been a very strong word and I'm just humbled by it He's so good. Pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus Christ, 
first off, this is for anybody struggling with alcohol or if you've had any demons of alcoholism. You know, just everybody just do the whole prayer. Say, Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Yeshua the Messiah. If there's an alcoholic demon in me or addiction spirits, overeating spirits, if that personality is in me, I don't want it. Forgive me, Jesus Christ. Wash me in your holy blood. I forgive my enemies. Heal my wounds with your oil and wine and fill me with your bread. You are my good Samaritan. Lord Jesus Christ. Break every generational curse off of me, especially the generational curse of alcoholism and drunkenness. I don't want to go to hell because of a stupid bottle of Bacardi, over drinking wine or getting drunk off of a six pack of beer. Lord, I want to be sober minded. So if you allow me to have wine for communion or a little bit with a steak meal or to cook a meal with that I will move in holiness and the fear of God, righteously using the wine you give me. But Lord, if you see that I can't handle it, then Lord, let me know and I'll stay away from wine. Other than communion, I'll use grape juice. Because Lord, it's not the physical wine that I'm worried about. I want your spiritual wine. Lord Jesus Christ, if there is any wine of the devil in me, any Babylonian wine from the whore that rides the beast, I renounce it now. I renounce the intoxication and I command it to come out now. Exhale. <sighs> Exhale it out. Come out in the name of Jesus Christ. All spiritual wine from the devil, I command you to come out. I will not be too drunk that I won't know the difference. I command you to leave my life. Every generational curse, every wound and pain that try to cause me to go to the bottle or to overeating. I break you in Jesus Christ's name. Lord, renew me. Renew the spirit of my mind. Make me sober. Make me hate alcoholism. Make me hate drunkenness. Make me hate overeating and surfeiting. Make me not get overtaken by the cares of this world. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for this revelation. Thank you, oh God. Now, Lord, finally, Jesus Christ. Finally, Lord. Finally, Lord. I want to say, forgive me. I repent for trotting you under my feet. I say that as the whole human race, even though I wasn't there, Lord. My sins are the reason that you had to be crushed. That God himself had to crush you in order to save me. And now that I know this revelation, oh God, I don't want to sin against you, Jesus. I want to love you. I want to honor you. I want to respect you. And anytime that I get tempted, I want to remember the Garden of Gethsemane. I want to remember you like you remembered me. You were willing to die for me. Would I be willing to die for you? You sacrificed me for me. Can I sacrifice for you? I have a greater respect for you, Jesus. I love you. I love you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for giving up Jesus Christ. And not only giving him up, but crushing him for me. I receive the wine of God right now. I receive the wine of God. I honor the blood of the Lamb. The wine of God. The bread which is his body. And the oil of the Holy Ghost. I receive you, Lord. Fill in me. Make me a new creature. Make me born again that I can be a new wine skin that can receive the new wine. And I know you guys are praying this prayer with me. Don't get caught up in my tears. Do this prayer with me. Say, Lord, if I'm not born again, if I have not been worthy to become a new creature yet, to receive the new wine, change me, Lord. Make me born again. Make me hate my old ways. Make me a new creation that I can receive my new wine. Oh, Jesus. I love you. Thank you, Lord. And Jesus, thank you for washing my feet. And please wash my feet. 
like you did Peter. Wash the judgment on my feet away. I don't want to be judged for trampling you under my feet. I don't want to be judged. I want to walk with you, not on you. I love you, Lord. So, Lord Jesus, if I'm a, if I'm wounded, Lord, fill me with your oil and wine. Clean me up. Change me. Make me hate alcoholism and drunkenness and overeating and the cares of this world. And make me love the word of God, prayer and fasting and fellowship. Make me know the difference between righteous and unrighteous, true prophets and false prophets. Make me know the difference between true ministries and false ministries. Give me that wisdom to see serpents transformed as ministers of light and false apostles that are not apostles. I love you, Lord. And I receive this anointing right now in the mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Father God, right now I pray for everybody listening, all your beloved, those that are in repentance, those that you see, Lord, that are trying, Lord. I ask you to bless them right now. Anyone struggling with alcoholism, you might have to do a three, four, five day fast and come back to this video. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I break the curse of alcoholism off the hearers. I break the curse of alcoholism off the households of the hearers. I break the curse of depression, generational curses of drunkenness, overeating. I break it in Jesus Christ's name. I command that al cool spirit to leave in the mighty name of Yeshua the Messiah. Emmanuel rebukes you. Lord, bring healing to their wounds. Pour in the oil and wine. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Lord, bring healing to them. May they walk with you and fear you and love you and honor you and never forget that you will crush for them. Change their lives with this word. Make it alive. In the name of Jesus Christ, seal them up with the signet of the king. Amen, Sheila. I'm, I'm done. I can't do no more, y'all. Love you so much. Appreciate all our partners that continually try to help this ministry go further. You should, this sh I shouldn't have to ask any of you to put these messages on your social media. Text message the link to your people in your phone book. Tell people about this ministry because in doing so, you're bringing them to a true prophetic ministry to help them become saved. It's not to bring them to me. It's to bring them to Christ in us. And for y'all that are helping this ministry go further with your prayers, the fellowship, your finances, we are trying to wage a war against a beast. We are outnumbered in the natural, but they're outnumbered in the spiritual. So are you, on, are you in this fight or not? We love you so much. Until next time, all glory to Christ. I, I was honored to be your servant to serve you the meal. Never forget, never forget that tender plan in Isaiah 53 that went to the Garden of Gethsemane, the crushing place for you and me. God the Almighty Father had to crush his own son to get the blood out. He used man. Never forget what Christ did for you. Never forget what God the Father did for you. Live holy because he deserves you to live holy. In Jesus Christ's name. Lord willing, we'll see you next time. Shalom.